And welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the fourth week of the Infrastructure Institute's Social Purpose Real Estate panel series. This is the final installment of the four part series, but please keep an eye on the Infrastructure Institute's newsletter and social media for more webinars coming up this year. My name is Alex Allen and I'm the program lead at the Infrastructure Institute. And the Infrastructure Institute is a training, advisory, and interdisciplinary research hub at the University of Toronto School of Cities. We seek to build local and global expertise in integrated planning for civil and social infrastructure, decision-making, and project delivery. Now, this four-part panel series is part of our ongoing groundwork initiative, which supports the development of social purpose real estate projects that can supply the missing housing, services, and other social infrastructure urgently needed in our cities. Our spree programs or social purpose real estate programs are largely capacity and network, network, sorry, network building programs, which you can also check out online. And through this work, we also seek to showcase many of the researchers, consultants, government agencies, and other sector partners who are doing the work that is moving these projects forward. And we're pleased to share that the United Way partners with the Infrastructure Institute to support an array of activities to build opportunities for social purpose real estate. This includes supporting initiatives such as the Groundwork Program series and this panel as well. Now, social purpose real estate, as we've been visiting through all of these conversations, is a term that has emerged in recent years to refer specifically to spaces developed, owned and operated um, by mission-driven operators to de deliver social value. And while this often refers to spaces owned and operated by nonprofit organizations and charities, this term also includes spaces and projects developed by or in partnership with uh, public and private sector agencies. And across Canada, this has been defined as projects like community hub spaces, affordable housing, shelters, art spaces, and creative mixed use projects that might combine all of the above. Now, building on what has already been discussed um, in the panels leading up to today, so we've talked about defining social purpose real estate in the first week of this series, then establishing board buy-in, and then routes to acquisition, which took place last week. Today's panel will focus more on a topic that really ties everything together, so building successful partnerships. And you can't build a social purpose real estate project without partnerships. And strong partnerships are necessary for the development of strong social infrastructure and social purpose real estate projects, but how do partners from across sectors and life experience build a shared vision and work collaboratively. The discussion that we'll be having today um, will examine what meaningful partnerships look like in social purpose real estate projects, and today's panelists will share experiences for best practices in developing alignment and building or, re or rebuilding trust. Now today we'll talk about some of the best or some of the main approaches um, that our panelists have used uh, and as well as their partners and the partners that they've worked with on the delivery of projects and in research and speak to the resources and approaches that have been helpful as well as pointing to some, th some things that are needed um, to further develop the sector. And we're thrilled to have three panelists in the room today with expertise in the areas of creative mixed use, indigenous relations and community engagement and nonprofit and affordable housing development. Now, just before we get started, some logistics to keep in mind for today's panel. So please feel free and encouraged to post questions and comments in the chat. We're going to have a Q&A period around 12.45 today, um, and my colleague, Nigel Carvalho, planner at the Institute, will synthesize one or two questions um, from the chat and from the comments. I'd recommend that you also uh, use the speakers view setting for this talk, which is available in the top right corner of your screen. We're also going to be making the, the recording for this uh, discussion available online, and we'll share the uh, link to that by the end of this week. Now, with all of this in mind, um, I'm pleased to introduce you to our three panelists today who will be expanding on this topic and speaking more to their experiences, building, fostering, and supporting the development of strong partnerships and social purpose real estate projects. So first off, we have Maddie Simiateki, a director of the Infrastructure Institute and professor of geography and planning at the University of Toronto. Um, so Maddie's work focuses on delivering large-scale infrastructure projects uh, evidence-based infrastructure investment decisions as well. Welcome, Maddie. 
And then next up, we have Bob Goulet, president of Nipissing Consulting. Bob Goulet is Anishinaabe from Nipissing First Nation. He is second degree member of the uh, Three Fires Midwayan Society and com a committed advocate of indigenous ways of knowing and being. Bob is a sought after speaker, traditional teacher and facilitator and master of ceremonies, providing a valuable cultural context and traditional knowledge to diverse audiences across Canada. Welcome, Bob. Thanks, Alex. And last not, but not least, we have Dean Fortin, um, Housing Development Consultant at Dean Fortin Strategies. Dean has been assisting First Nations and nonprofit housing providers in BC for the last 10 years to develop and operate affordable housing for elders, low-income families, and individuals with disabilities. And welcome, Dean. And welcome everyone, and we're so pleased to have everyone here today for the fourth and final installment of this series. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen in just a second. Um, and so to get us started today, um, we have a few questions for all of the panelists, but I wanted to invite all of our panelists um, to, and to do a bit of a brief go around, inviting each, um, each person to share more about, you know, what in your opinion and based on your experiences, what's the significance of partnerships in the development of social purpose real estate projects specifically? Maybe ask for a volunteer to get us started out of Bob, Maddie, and Dean. Well, I'll jump in. Um, I, I think a couple of quick notes that I had to myself that I wanted to bring up for sure is uh, been been on many sides of, of various tables. And I think the one thing I learned early in fundraising as an executive director in a nonprofit is the group you work with, the clients you represent, the people you you, you try to assist, you have many needs. Um, and often in the beginning you would go to a funder, you'd go to someone that you need to build partnerships with and say, we have these needs, we have these needs. And, and, and what I found very quickly is they would say, every group has needs. Um, and so the, the key to success was always to, how do you reframe um, your approach to say, what is it that the group you're approaching, what do they want to accomplish? Where do their needs uh, come in? How do you how do you give them what they want? Uh, and that's how uh, I think is the key to successful partnerships uh, as you start to move forward and start to try and build relationships. Um, I mean, the other piece I want to throw in is everybody has a dream. You know, I want to build this housing, I want to do this. Um, but you need land if you want to get a project. So, you know, those are the two... Uh, Key things I just wanted to throw in to start off with. Yeah, yeah, and that's great. Thank you, thank you so much, Dean. Um, Bob, can I hand it over to you? Sure, Alex. Thanks very much. Bonjour, Nindwe Magana Dok. Bonjour, Nikana Sadok. Jacquetin dish Nakas, Migizi and Dodem, Nibissing Ojibwe and Ishnabe and the Tagani, Minwa, Nipissing First Nation, Nindonje. Start with that uh, important uh, protocol greeting, uh, acknowledging uh, my name, Jacquet, which refers to that place in the cloud world where this intersects the spirit realm. And I'm of the Bald Eagle clan from Nipissing First Nation. I think this is important dialogue. Uh, and one of the, the necessary things required in order to move forward on social purpose, real estate, uh, you know, any kind of project across uh, our traditional territories, every part of Canada is traditional territory, is to see that equity. And that equity requires, you know, that that need for land. And it's a, it's something we're afraid to talk about. I mean, every time we say the word land back, people panic and not wanting to know what that is. That you know, you envision warriors and overturned cars and those things that we've seen in Caledonia. Well, land back is really about, you know, that that um returning that equity back to First Nation communities, uh, sharing that, that benefit with Métis and Inuit as well in this territory. Uh, the reality is that uh, in Canada, all of these lands, the, the, uh, the uh, underlying title of all of these lands either still are, or at one time were held by Indigenous people, by British common law, by the standard of, of, of right, um, is held by Indigenous people. Yet today, First Nations only have access to 2% of land in Canada. So it really begins with land. It really begins with equity. It begins with justice and really, um, you know, trying to equalize that. And, you know, partnerships are also incredibly important. That's what we're here to talk about today. When there are partnerships, when there is that understanding, we start to, you know, realize the need 
in Indigenous communities, what those needs are, what those aspirations are. We start to, you know, develop those good relationships and, uh, and partnerships, and we start to see the reasons why reconciliation is important, why we need to move towards uh, that to increased social equity and social purpose. So that's where I'll start. So thanks very much, Alex. Thanks so much, Bob. Yeah. Um, Maddie, over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Alex. Thanks, Bob and Dean. What a, a fantastic lead in to some of uh, my thoughts as well, which is, I think part at the core of partnership is something that we think a lot about at the Infrastructure Institute, which is the idea of the collaborative advantage. It's that by working together, you can achieve more than you could do on your own. And that can mean more in many different ways. It could be more uh, social impact, it could be more uh, a, a bigger project, it could be more housing, uh, or it could be even just realizing a project that your organization or group may not have either the financial resources, the technical expertise, the land and physical resources, the staff capacity uh, to do on your own. And, and I think that's where for me, uh, and, and uh, both Dean and Bob uh, got at this a little bit, that's where for me, the, this idea of collaboration can be so valuable, but it starts with an understanding of what your, uh, what your partner ultimately, where they're coming from and what their needs are. I think uh, Dean said it really uh, beautifully that we often come to these things thinking about what we need to get out of a partnership. And of course we should define our own goals and keys for success for ourselves. But if, if you go into a partnership only thinking about what you're going to achieve and not starting out with what you're, where you're, where you're a partner, what, what success means to them, then uh, you will ultimately uh, run into challenges. And so I think this idea of collaboration being really uh, uh, clear about what you and your part your partners want to get out of it and having pretty frank conversations at the beginning and I'm so struck with uh, with with when you look at collaborations over a large number of them and my group uh, both uh, Alex and and, and, and colleagues at the infrastructure Institute, we've studied over 50 or 60 of these projects now where there's been some type of collaboration that's led to a social purpose real estate project and what you see overwhelmingly is you can almost point to the individuals there's usually a project champion uh, uh, within each of the organizations who is so instrumental, who just brings a mentality of openness and uh, a desire to see a shared win rather than a personal win. Uh, and when you start from that position, you end up with projects that can uh, really achieve so much more than what any of the organizations could on their own. Now, one note of caution, because I think we've all tried to do collaborations and we love to realize collaborative advantage. There's also a concept in, in academia of uh, collaborative inertia that, you know, because we've talked so much about the, the benefits of collaboration, we tend to try and, and, and stick with collaborations, even as we see that they're not working or that they're becoming more and more uh, frustrating or that your counterparty may be uh, trying to achieve more than, uh, than other partners in the arrangement. And I think we then need to recognize that collaboration is hard work that it does require mutual learning and, uh, uh, and, and, and we do often have to sacrifice a bit of our own goals in order to achieve something for everyone. And in doing that, the outcome is better, but, uh, but we do need to recognize that this, that this, it's easy to talk about this in the abstract about how great collaboration is. And, and ultimately the research shows that it is, but we should really recognize that this is work and it requires a very specific type of both institutional structure uh, and personalities around the table uh, if we're ultimately going to uh, make meaningful uh, partnerships uh, for social purpose real estate. Thanks so much, Maddie. Yeah, and I, I wonder if um, just thinking of who might be in the audience today, if if any of you or all of you can speak to whether you think um, you know organizations might need to or like agencies developing this these projects um, might be best off hiring a consultant to help with um, those conversations from the very beginning, or if this is something that organizations might be able to do on their own, um, as long as the, you know, the conversation is open and they're really listening to each other. Open floor for anyone who wants to comment on that. Maybe I'll jump in on that, Alex. And, and one of the things I really, uh, you know, we, we need to look at uh, kind of social equity in all, all um, aspects. And I think, uh, Having that advice, you know, does create an opportunity for um, a consultant, for a service provider, for uh, somebody to, to get that advice on, on how to create those relationships and how to enable that. And that doesn't often mean just, 
you know, advice on the real estate side, but the relationship side as well. You know, uh, who can put those connections together with the urban Indigenous community, with the Indigenous-led, Indigenous-serving organizations, with the local First Nation, with the local Métis Council. And, you know, it's cultivating that relationship that's that's important. Um, one of my, um, you know, my top 10 of, of, uh, of working with uh, First Nation Métis Inuit is to develop those formal relationships, those partnerships, to move beyond just when we have to talk to First Nations Métis Inuit, that duty to consult. We need to go beyond that, to have that open conversation, to know our partners. And that takes investing in that. So I really, you know, I'm a big advocate of getting that advice and hopefully that advice leading to building that capacity. I'd love to see all of those, um, you know, real estate consultants, real estate brokers, those people that put together these deals to actually have First Nation Métis Inuit people working for them, you know, to, you know, be more reflective of First Nation Métis Inuit Anishinaabe worldview in those things. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Bob. And I think maybe this will um, this is a good transition into my first question for you specifically. Um, is speaking to your work, uh, Bob, on the pre uh, pre consultation phase of um, of a project, because um, a lot of your work does focus on that phase. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little more bit more to why that's important in a large scale project um, with a lot of stakeholders. Yeah, I think a, a, what a lot of, uh, you know, developers, um, government uh, relates to when it comes to working with First Nations Métis Inuit is something called the duty to consult. So in 2004, the Supreme Court ruled in a couple of, uh, you know, high profile cases that when the Crown, you know, uh, is contemplating uh, activity that may impact Indigenous rights, that there is a, a constitutional duty to consult. And in the in the case that that actual uh, um, consultation results in some kind of impact, direct impact, there's a further duty to accommodate. Well, for me, that that's just a minimum duty. Now we need to move beyond that. And I'll give you a great example. So if we were just to follow the provincial government's guidance on the duty to consult, the federal government's actual um, guidance provided in 2011, you don't even talk to anybody until the second phase. You go through a legal analysis, you go through a risk analysis, you go through this ridiculous activity where you pull out a map, you draw a hundred kilometer radius on your map with your compass. And if there happens to be a First Nation community in that dot or some kind of uh, assertion or, or, um, or uh, um, land claim, then that's who you talk to. My advice to all partners, anybody that wants to work with the Indigenous community is to get to know our people. Develop those relationships long before you need them because you are going to need them. When it comes to transactions on, on, related to land, it's ripe with those pitfalls. If you already have a partner, you know, you know who they are, you know how they work, you have that relationship, you're going to, to benefit from that. So, you know, we need to move beyond that duty to consult. And that begins, as you mentioned, that first process is pre-engagement. Have that, have that conversation even before you announce your project, even before you begin the land transaction. Let the First Nation, local First Nations know in the territory what's going to transpire. Because the last thing you want, especially on a land deal, is to, you know, First Nations to be caught, uh, you, know, um, you know, surprised by what's going on. So if you have those relationships, you know, you've got some of that trust built and, you know, it will help you as you develop your project moving forward. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I think that's such an important takeaway for this conversation too. And especially, yeah, thinking again and emphasizing that the consultation process should not be when people are finding about, out about the project for the first time. Um, ideally, you've been having lots of discussions leading up to that point as well. Um, I'm wondering if you might be able to, um, and I didn't include this in the questions, but if you can point to specific projects that you think have done a great job with this, um, and whether those are projects that you've worked on or um, other projects that you kind of point to. Yeah, a couple of them. One of the, both of them I worked on. One of them here in the city is actually um, it's not a direct duty to consult case. The the Supreme Court and the and the federal guidance talks about if there's an actual impact. Well, we need again to to have those conversations before you have impacts, before those projects are out there. Um, so I really I'm a firm believer in master planning to work directly with First Nations Métis Inuit to develop those master plans. And one of them I worked on recently is the uh, Toronto Islands master plan. 
uh, talking about the development of the Toronto Islands Park. Well, you know, to me, that's uh, a case where we went to um, the not only the First Nation rights holders, but also the Métis Council, the urban Indigenous community. We work with an, a group of elders, of the Michisaugee elders, to talk about, you know, what are the needs of the community with regard to the spirit of the land and Indigenous worldview when it comes to relationships with the land, the water, um, the fish life, the bird life, all of those things around the island. Um, how do we make sure that those are integrated in, you know, not only just telling the story, this isn't about storytelling and, and creating a tourism product, but it's how we make sure that that worldview penetrates um, what, what's happening at, uh, at the Toronto Islands. And that's one really good example. Another one recently I did was uh, with um, uh, Trent University in Peterborough, where they created that Trent Lands Plan, but not only the Lands Plan, we, we expanded that further to create that nature areas plan. How do we protect the nature areas surrounding that beautiful campus in uh, north of Peterborough? And that was a process of co-developing that with the local First Nation Métis Inuit. When we're talking about working with Indigenous peoples, it's not just con consultation. It's not just engagement. It's how we co-develop these things. How do we do these things together? And that's the future of the relationship with uh, with First Nations, Métis Inuit peoples. Thank you if so I, much. Oh, yep. Well, I, I just wanted to jump on because, and, and thank you, Bob. You, you both remind me and add to my knowledge. And I um, uh, link between the, the previous question and this one is that the it's about trust. When you talk about setting up relationships, so my experience has been, how do you establish trust? Um, and then sometimes it goes both ways. Um, I do remember meeting with uh, Chief Robert Sam of the Songhees um, in my initial days, and it was, and I, and I really wanted to make sure I was doing things right. And so I asked him, you know, please let me know if I if I say the wrong thing because I don't know. Um, and, and I will say Chief Sam was a bit rough on me. He says, you, you you'll know when you said the wrong thing because I'll stop talking to you. <laughs> okay, that you know. So you know, as a uh, as a group, as a municipality at that time, reaching out, you you want to make sure you're doing things the right way. And so having that opportunity to build relationships, to look for people within the nations um, or groups that can help be your guide is really really important. I've also found it the other way around, where First Nation groups have been historically taken advantage of in so many ways that they're naturally suspicious um, and for good reason. Um, and so, but what I do find is once you've established trust with one group, um, they are more than willing and happy to pass it on to the next group. Um, you know, so, so it, it is, uh, I think, um, an understanding that that's where you start, you base that relationship. Um, and probably the final piece uh, is, you know, we always in community consultation, it's about where, when you're talking to people, can they see themselves in the project? And I think that's really important to, to you know, whether there's a physical or a community identity that you can add to the project that people go, okay, you know, I can see where this, this, is, this piece has been added. Um, and that's part of the way that you build trust and, and support. Hmm. Thanks so much, Dean. Yeah, and I think this reframing is so important. So going looking at it, you know, going from consultation to actual co-development and partnership building, and then seeing these partnerships as a process of developing trust um, to ensure that the project is successful and not just, you know, to check a box and to have conversations because you're supposed to be having those conversations. But, um, you know, making sure that, as you said, people that um, are in the community already and are going to be impacted by the partner uh, by the project um, see themselves as you said um, in the project moving forward um, I wanted to head over to Maddie now to see um, if you can speak to the research that you do so much of the research that you do focuses on the collaborative advantage and I'm wondering if you can speak to how that's looked in the development of social purpose real estate projects um, and if you can provide some examples of that as well yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, let me first just start by picking up on some of the themes that Bob and Dean talked about, because I think they're exactly right. This is about trust and about co-creation. And to Dean's last point, trust is slow to build and quick to break. Uh, you know, so in, in 
so we it's it's about that relationship then so what it's you know there are going to be ups and downs in any relationship and it's a matter of having the foundation that's strong enough that uh when things do arise uh you're able to uh navigate your way through them and 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 fall back on and draw on those, those wells of a trusting uh relationship and that that really is uh, key in this space because what we've what we've found in uh in in our own research is that the reason that people are entering into partnership, I mean, there's also that old line uh, that you often hear around, like if, if you could do it yourself, you would have done it already. And for a variety of reasons, in many instances, individual organizations and groups are not able to do projects on their own. And we often think that that's something directed at the nonprofit or, uh, or, or other sectors, but actually that also applies to the private sector too. We've studied cases where private sector developers have wanted to build a building on a site uh, and for all sorts of reasons, either because of who was there before, or because of community opposition, or because of um, zoning uh, constraints, uh, or even financial constraints, they weren't able to do that project. And so, they, uh, you know, it, it, this isn't just the type of thing where the nonprofit uh, sectors uh, and stakeholders are looking for partnership and everyone else is trying to go it alone. There really is, uh, there are these situations where uh, time and again, uh, that, that partners need to come together and find opportunities to collaborate, or they won't be able to get what they want uh, themselves. And we've seen this uh, in a variety of instances. Um, I'll just use some examples from the city of Toronto just to uh, paint you a bit of a picture of, uh, of, of what this looks like. So um, uh, one example would be uh, the Tiff Bell Lightbox, which is a major uh, uh, arts and cultural facility that probably many people are familiar with. Um, TIFF is a nonprofit, actually. It's not actually a city owned uh, or city led organization. And uh, they had outgrown the fact that they had no space. And if you can remember back uh, a number of decades before the Lightbox, they were hosting that. Uh, that film festival all over the city and they really would have benefited from having a central uh, location and a central theater to host their uh, activities and they had they had no resources themselves they had no land and they didn't have a huge financial endowment that they could draw on so they were going to need to use partnership and they found and in, in this case the Reitman family then they used that to leverage collaborations with uh, Daniels Corporation uh, and then Bell and, and, and different orders of government to bring money uh, to the table. Uh, another, uh, another example uh, would be the Red Door Shelter in the east end of the city of Toronto. So this is uh, a homeless shelter that had been operating out, of, operating out of a united church for many years and the church congregation was dwindling and decided it was time for them to sell the building. Uh, and the church, uh, the, 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 the shelter, if given their own uh, uh, preference at the time would have really preferred just to have been uh, either donated or had had government money to buy the church itself and then do maybe a light renovation and ultimately the government didn't give them the money and the church got sold to a developer so they were going to be out and the developer came forward uh, and ultimately uh, uh, came to a, a resolution where uh, the, the, the shelter would stay in uh, the building and be incorporated into a condominium and again the, the process that that uh, followed in order to make this a uh, unique partnership work is really uh, creative and required a long term uh, trust building relationship. Um, and finally, and, and Bob, I'd, I'd be really interested in your thoughts is a project that has caught my attention, I think is really uh, has a potentially really exciting is the indigenous hub in the West onlands where uh, the, in, uh, the indigenous community was, uh, uh, I think was uh, given the land back so we talked about land back was given the land. Uh, on a site in the West Donlands, uh, and then had to find a model in order to rebuild it. And um, I, I don't know enough about that project, and I'd love to learn more. Uh, but I've, I've read some of the speeches from the groundbreaking, and it was really remarkable to hear the different parties to that, uh, including uh, Chief Laform uh, from uh, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, talk about the process of bringing thousands of people to participate, to create the vision, and then the collaboration that allowed the financial partnership for a space that is now going to have, and is currently under construction, is going to have uh, uh, spaces for um, training uh, and, uh, and, and health and wellness, uh, as well as as well as housing and a really remarkable collaboration. So uh, I would love to learn more about this, but it, it just speaks to the ideas of what collaboration uh, can do and how you can advance projects that uh, that that move beyond uh, again what any of the partners uh, on their own could do, including the private sector. This isn't this isn't something that's like a private sector uh, giveaway uh, to the to the nonprofit sector. It's it's a much it, when when this works well, it's really based on uh, mutual benefit.
Thanks so much, Maddie. And I think that's so that's so important to think of too, is like how how like who can come together to make it a project that is actually mutually beneficial and addresses some of the challenges that each actor is facing in the development of a project. Um, Bob, I did want to pass it over to you just in case you do have a comment uh, in relation to uh, what Maddie just asked. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a great example, Maddie, that uh, that uh, that indigenous hub that's going to be built there is not only going to be host to the uh, Anishinaabe Health Toronto's mm -hmm. uh, health center, so a modern health center being created. Uh, you know, for long for too long, you know, Anishinaabe Health, one of the larger agencies in the city, has been relegated to pretty small facilities that have, that are very aged and. Uh, haven't aged well either to create a, a modern clinic, a place where appropriate services can be delivered. But it's not just the health center. It's going to be a home to a number of other agencies that will use that uh, that place for um, for their uh, their offices. It'll be a place where you know there's going to be some public realm spaces um, uh, within it that will play host potentially to marketplaces and pop-ups for Indigenous mm. um, vendors to be able to sell their wares and uh, um, be able to see this as a community centre, a hub for activity that's not just about health. But And you mentioned uh, housing. I wish there was a bit more affordable housing mm -hmm. to that. But in order to make it viable, you know, we have, um, you know, created a model where, you know, Part of that uh, that facility uh, will end up being um, market housing for uh, you know to, that'll go out to market. But that even that partnership will benefit Indigenous peoples. You know, there's no saying that it should be just uh, um, uh, big real estate developers that develop uh, condos and and uh, and that kind of housing. Indigenous peoples can benefit from that too. Indigenous people can be developers and, uh, you know, making that part of the, uh, the Indigenous economy and growing that. And, you know, that's what we're seeing in the, in the, in the Dawn lands there. Can I pick up on just one other point, uh, just on this, which is about the, the design of the building too. And Bob, I'm sure you would speak to this with more time. I mean, the design is remarkable. It was designed by uh, uh, Indigenous architects, Turo architects. And, you know, I think that's another piece that's important too, is inscribing in our physical spaces. Again, what that collaboration means. And I think that's, I would encourage people, if you have a chance to go and look, they've now put the cladding on some of the lower floors. And it's, it's remarkable, the detailing of the tiling uh, that just looks it, it looks completely different than other buildings in the city and picks up on some of uh, uh, some of the, the the themes in in uh, indigenous led architecture. And I think again, it just speaks to doing it, it speaks to what is underlying in that building, which is doing things in a different way. And I think that's you know, and I, th I think that at its core is where we have real opportunities when we think uh, when we think differently and we bring uh, different uh, uh, parties to the to the table uh, as owners, not just as participants, but really as owners. And, and Bob mentioned that earlier, and I think that's absolutely right. Thanks so much, Maddie, and thanks so much, Bob. And um, this is a good segue uh, in talking about housing and affordable housing specifically. Um, I want to go back to Dean. Um, now, so you've been working with First Nations groups in BC on developing community-driven housing solutions. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak more to how some of those partnerships have evolved and speak to some of the specific examples as well. Oh, you are muted, Dean, sorry. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, where to start uh, is, is actually the big question. I mean, I do want to jump in, perhaps um, uh, move forward as we move backwards as we move forward. Um, like, I think a lot of the conversation that's going on here is with, with profit developers. And in that regard, I think it's really important that local governments um, or regional or perhaps even a provincial and federal jump in and set the incentives. Like, it is a recognition that for profit developers, ultimately are there to make you know to to um, make a profit one of the things we have for lack of a better term in in municipalities is we have free airspace um that's something that you can contribute and and the opportunity for a government to say you must include significant enough significant um affordable housing um in any development in any process will set that bar and clearly the developer's not gonna do it for free. Um, they will lose money, but if they can have, have that, you know, using that uh, concept of density and all those other things that you can uh, allow for the, to then go to the benefit of the nonprofit is really important. 
But without that government direction, it's not going to happen. Um, it'll rarely happen. It's probably a better way to put it um, um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, unless, of course, it's where, you know, a very, very large person needs to either pay back a community or they're leaving a community and want to leave a legacy. Um, obviously, there's there's um, individuals. But so, for example, uh, I want to mean some of the pieces I just wanted to throw out so to, to spark um, people's ideas um, where the local government in Victoria uh, needed to build a new fire station right downtown. Um, the opportunity to put eight stories of, of housing on top of that fire department in the downtown, housing for, for low income, um, is, is a great opportunity there. Um, we worked with school district, um, an opportunity to uh, do a land swap, but in so doing create affordable housing. Uh, in that housing was daycares, in that housing built by the local community center in partnership was shared space. So during the day, the school could use the gym facilities and use the, the workout rooms, and yet the community could use it in, in, the, in the evenings and on weekends, that their shared um, uh, um, classroom space, same thing. Um, you know, the school using it for, for classroom reasons and, and students, but again, in the evenings and, and on weekends, it can be used by the community. So looking for all those variety of partnerships, um, is where a lot of it can really come forward. Um, it is uh, fantastic to have daycares in, in affordable housing. You know, as they say that all daycares need to be within 15 minutes of your of your of your work or your home. Think about low income individuals that can come down of their building. You know, have their children there. Um, then they don't need the minivan to drive around everywhere. You know, I mean, there's all those pieces that come off of that. Um, that then there's an opportunity for them to come home. And then again, the, the playground and that space is available to you and your children on the evenings and weekends. Um, so it's a really great way to integrate and, and have that. What we found um, is that um, uh, working, working with First Nations, I also wanna highlight this. And, and again, I wanna to speak to the fact that it's from um, a BC perspective. Uh, I recognize, and I'll even say from community to community, community can be different in BC. Um, but I must say that, and it's not, probably not speaking to anything people don't know, but the Indian Act is such a barrier to develop um, and have First Nations involvement that it can be such a challenge. Um, for instance, the community in uh, one of the First Nations I'm working with, um, we have to go through a designation process. I want you to think about what it'd be like in the city of Toronto if every time somebody came forward with a development, you had to go to a full municipal election. Every single development. That's crazy making. Um, and it just politicizes on an individual basis every development, right? And so um, when we talk about development, when we talk about, you know, here the community has a vision that you may have levels of government that then start to go in the way. And I understand why, but how can I put it? Um, the more I work, the more I understand uh, the challenges that First Nations can, can face. So our legislation needs to catch up to the political realities and um, uh, of today, not to continue to hold people back in the past. So um, we've done, um, we're, having, we're having great success in a variety of ways. Um, at First Nations, it was a case of where um, we were working on a, um, an individual 112 units of affordable housing for, for, for seniors. Um, but the people, the nonprofit that was running that society said, you really must meet with our local First Nations group. They're interested in doing housing. And that was the introduction. And then as we started to do introduction, uh, you know, achieve success um, under the Rapid Housing Initiative, people are probably familiar with that. Um, BC Housing decided that it's gonna start building on reserve. What a forward thinking provincial government to actually say, um, let's go do it. You know, why are we, you know, why are we not engaging there uh, when that's where the high need? Um, we were able to successfully get some um, 28 townhouses for, for uh, three and four bedrooms, big issue on First Nations. Um, everybody in the, everybody says build one and two bedroom apartments. That's not what the First Nations always need. 
Um, having said that, we're also building a 30 unit apartment for elders and individuals um, and have the opportunity right now under the spectrum to go back and say an emergency shelter for indigenous women and children fleeing abuse, um, next stage housing, supportive housing for, for um, indigenous uh, community uh, for members. In Kamloops, they did a, a, a housing count, 200 homeless on the street on one night, 98 of them were First Nations. And so to be able to take that information and say, why aren't we building on reserve? Why aren't we bringing an opportunity to bring these individuals back to their community where the community supports? And then, and then those are all the learning. I want to throw in some learning stuff. Like um, I've run many supportive housing. Um, you always talk about, you know, safe consumption rooms or safe injection rooms and all of that. When meeting with First Nations, the first thing they say is, where's the room where the family comes and visits? Um, in the non-native community, you know, um, like the family is, there is no family involved. The people who often it's very challenging. It's so much of the culture. And so much of the healing that that you would put in. Um, so it's a continual learning uh, opportunity on behalf of me to understand, um, to to listen to what the community is putting forward, what's important to them, and and how do we put that in? Landscaping will be traditional herbs and um, uh, uh, um, you know that 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 are um, vegetation that is used in cultural practices. You know, it's not just you know, your traditional high, you know, we have a development, we're going to put in grass here, we're going to have some nice fruit trees here, um, or, you know, some variety of bushes and stuff. These are, these are important things to, to think about every element and, mm -hmm. and look for that, that opportunity for the meet with the elders, let them provide you guidance. Mm -hmm. um, there's some, these are, it's funny, even within the First Nations, there are stakeholder groups you need to meet with. Yeah. The elders, cultural development, education, daycare um and youth groups mm -hmm. um, i remember yeah. our, just to lead with this lead with this i remember the first landscape plan we got for the um townhouses is the, the landscape person said okay and it, they did, designed it all and then they threw in a bocce court right well if you work for the first nations the first no one's playing bocce it's like where's the basketball court you need to understand the community right so those are part of the stuff that um you go back and have an opportunity to talk about yeah, thanks so much, Jean. I think, yeah, that's so important in every partnership development and conversations on new projects too, is, you know, you don't enter any community assuming it's going to be like other another project in, in another community that you've been engaging with as well. Um, I'm wondering just before we uh, go to Nigel for some of the questions, I wonder if we can go around and considering um, the organizations that might be in the room today or the the agencies that might be in the room today, What's a piece of advice that you would share with them if they're considering starting a new project in terms of, um, you know, figuring out what partnerships might help them to, you know, to get a project started? Um, so just uh, we'll go around um, to each of the panelists and just, you know, first piece of advice that comes to mind of something that you would share with an organization in the room today. Uh, Bob, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, I would say develop those relationships. Uh, they could be formal relationships through memorandum of understanding or benefit agreements, uh, ways of sharing decision making, you know, sharing that that um, um, decision making capacity. Uh, yeah, I think that's so important, uh, you know, and doing it in in um, in a in a patient way. You know, it, it's going to take those three cups of tea I often speak about. You know, it's uh, going to be having those initial conversations, fostering those to uh, to where you can actually talk about some of the goals and where we're at. But only in that third cup of tea do you really get to the point where we're co-developing things, where we're working in true partnerships. You know, that takes patience and uh, it takes a lot of trust and it takes time to do that. Yeah, we need to be mindful of these colonial time frames. Anytime you put a time frame on something, you've colonized it. So how do we decolonize it? How, we, how do we work backwards to incorporate relationship development, partnership development, capacity development in all of these things that we do? So that, you know, really takes, uh, that answer has to come from Indigenous peoples as well. Thank you so much, Bob. And that is a that is a very important thing to remember. I really like that. And I thank you for sharing that just about timing and just, you know, there's no need to rush. Um, and, you know, it can harm a project if you rush these conversations. Uh, Maddie, over to you. 
Oh, you are muted. Of course. Uh, Bob talked about the external part of the partnership relationship, and I would talk about the internal part, is uh, looking internally to your own organization to, to see what are uh, what is important to you and is your organization ready to partner? Do you have, uh, especially if we're talking in specifics about real estate, um, do you have the uh, governance structures set up that enable uh, a partnership uh, to happen? Do you have the people who are going to need to uh, approve that internally? Uh, are all of them uh, already on board? Uh, what are the points that are really the, the must-haves? What are the needs-to-haves? And what are the uh, want to haves, and uh, so that so that when you're going into a partnership, uh, and and then ultimately getting to the tables uh, where you're discussing uh, across the table with with a, a potential partner, that that you have lined up which areas are so critical that 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 those are the uh, the the lines that are 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 critical, and others where you may be able to uh, uh, negotiate and um, compromise with your with your partners because uh, partnerships are always. Uh, partly about compromise as well. And, um, and, and so understanding internally, uh, having all of your processes and uh, uh, um, understandings of your own organization in place, I think is really actually as important, uh, is, is the foundation upon which you then go out uh, and, and can have uh, uh, create meaningful relationships. Thanks so much, Maddie. And Dean, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I think, Perhaps what I would add is that I think that within every every development provides an opportunity to continue to give. Um, so I think capacity building is one of the largest things that that you can add into any development. That that needs to be a specific and and, and recognize that that's what you're going to do. And you know it's not about going in and doing it for the First Nation or for the nonprofit. Um, that it has to be part of a capacity building. Um, and that needs to be spelled out right at the beginning, um, that, that this is part of what we're going to give and what's going to be put there. Um, yeah, so I just want to make sure that that, that element was added um, with, a, with a deliberate opportunity for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dean. And we have, so now we have uh, just a short period of time for maybe one question from the audience. Nigel, I'm going to pass it over to you for what you think the, the one question should be. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> I'm going to use Patrick's first question. Um, and Patrick was wondering, can the panel speak to project contract structures that help drive the alignment of stakeholders? So do you have experience or know of any contract structures that sort of can help smooth over any of the disagreements or any of the possible um, things that come up through a partnership? I'll start with that, Nigel, <clears throat> and I'm going to be brief because I'm not a, uh, not a lawyer, but I've been involved in a lot of these. The first thing I'm going to say, I see, I hear a word being batted over and over again today by a few of us, not pointing any fingers. It's the word stakeholder. I want everyone, when it comes to the word stakeholder and their dealings with First Nations, Métis, Inuit, to eliminate that from your vocabulary. And the reason being is First Nations are rights holders in Canada with rights protected under the constitution, section 35, uh, we shouldn't be comparing the governments of a nation to local, you know, you know, interest holders and little community associations. Those are important, you know, for that community, but we're talking about legitimate governments of our nation. So that, that's, that's, you know, good advice for folks. Let's eliminate the word stakeholder from our vocabulary. Um, when it comes to contracts, uh, definitely I want to I want to uh, really um, bestow the virtue of having um, a kind of an informal way of starting those. Begin with simple memoranda of understanding. Begin with simple non-binding contractual uh, agreements first. Getting used to working together. You know, you know. Let's let's eliminate these uh, the the way we do real estate right now and those you know very uh, comprehensive contracts. If we're establishing relationships, what are the parameters of a relationship? What are those bodies we're going to create? Working groups, uh, forums. How are we going to uh, do that? How are we going to contribute to that capacity? 
through, you know, uh, funding mechanisms, you know, identifying that in those, those memorandum of understanding. When it comes to developing big uh, real estate projects, uh, social purpose and others, you know, you're definitely going to have to get into those real estate transactions. But when you're starting out with those conversations with First Nation, Métis, Inuit communities, begin with those uh, more informal memorandum of understanding that develops and, and, you know, sets the parameters for relationships. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, Maddie and Dean, do you have uh, comments on the question? I was just going to say, as, as Bob was talking, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, the lawyers are going to have a fit. But uh, <laughs> often what you hear said is, by the time you get to needing the contract, it's too late. You're already way down the path of a conflict that is going to be hard to resolve with any other mechanism other than litigation and 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 other types of remediations that are just going to be painful and expensive for everyone. And I, I couldn't agree with with Bob more that this is if you're really about building a relationship, start with the values that underpin that and the contractual terms uh, ultimately will follow. And of course, you need a contract. Uh, that spells out who's responsible for what and shared spaces and how the funding is going to work and who's going to shovel the walkway and, uh, you know, all of the other uh, details of the project. But uh, it starts with, the, with, with, with shared values and you find in good partnerships that, uh, that, that often the contract stays in the drawer. That, that it's, it's not that there's no conflicts, but it's that, the, as Bob said, that the governance arrangements are strong enough that people can uh, either pick up a telephone or, or come together over tea or get in a room together uh, before the conflict uh, or, the, or the point of tension uh, shifts from something that's local to something that is, is now engulfing the entire project. So, um, you know, maybe that's kind of a uh, a hopeful way of thinking about doing deals and relationships. But I, I actually think it's it, what we find over time is that those are the, the ones where people are constantly going back to the contract. Those are relationships that are fragile and where probably upfront enough trust wasn't built. And so everyone wanted to paper that deal uh, and, 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 and as much as possible. And uh, it really uh, what works best is when we take the time up front, make sure that the relationships are strong. Um, and, and I guess one other point on that is that you know, these projects are going to last for decades. Like this isn't like a, a, a contract. This is a relationship. And we also need to think about the human side of this and that people, people are going to change over time. So even if two people or, or a team have a relationship at the outset, thinking about the staffing and, and how the, like succession planning and how it's going to evolve when new people who are not party to that original conversation become involved, I think is also maybe just something, a seed to plant that is not, is not the easiest thing. And we find that in these long-term relationships can get lost, but thinking through uh, succession planning and relationship uh, evolution is also uh, important as well. Thanks so much, Maddie. And Dean, did you have a final word on this question? I, I, I smile because on when, when I have developers involved um, in nonprofits or First Nations, um, a non-binding MOU is, 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 is almost like one of the first things you do. Um, so you're right, Bob. I mean, that's, that's where to start. Just sort of like everybody's kind of clear, uh, well, at least it's has a sense of where we're going together and that we're all in, in the boat together. And I think the other piece I want to add on to the tale of Maddie's, um, because I think it's really important is I remember when we're building a large community center, we had to raise a couple million dollars out of the community. One of the, um, local members, a developer, a, a owner, a, a business owner and stuff. Um, he said one of the mistakes that um, other people have done in the past is they would gather us in and we'd all donate towards the construction. And then he said, and then they'd let us go. Um, so that is, so it's ultimately that. How do you maintain those relationships over the next five or 10 or 15 years? And those people that are there to help you build um, will still be there for you later on when you need help with family programs, when you need to throw a fundraiser. I mean, so having that ongoing involvement and interaction, I think, um, it, it, you know, it's not a one-time thing that starts and ends with the contract under mm -hmm. construction. Where, where does everybody, where does the community allow to continue to remain and be part of that? So, yeah. 
Thank you so much. And I, I'm going to stop us short right there because um, I know our panelists have to go right before one. Um, but I just want to take a moment to thank you all so much, Bob, Dean, and Maddie, for being here today. Um, it's been such a pleasure. And just a reminder to everyone in the audience, please be sure to check out their work and um, stay tuned for more updates. Um, our, the Infrastructure Institute will be sharing um, some links and some takeaways from these conversations, uh, as well as a link to the recording of this conversation uh, later this week. So we encourage you to check that out as well. So a round of applause. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, it's been so great having everyone participating in these discussions over the last four weeks. And we're really looking forward to continuing to engage with, engage with folks in the coming months as we develop more programs and um, host more online discussions on social purpose real estate. So thank you so much again, and we look forward to seeing everybody as the program develops. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Hi, Sharon. I'm just seeing your question about obtaining the recordings from the previous sessions. And yes, you can. We'll be we'll be putting them on our website, um, but they're also on the School of Cities YouTube page. I, I know at least two of them are now. There might be a third up at this point, and we'll be putting this one up as well. So if you just look up School of Cities on YouTube. Yes, yes. And we'll share, thanks, Nigel. Um, we'll share that link in a follow-up email in the coming days as well. Um, there's a playlist with uh, with all of the videos. But thanks, everyone. Okay. Uh, <laughs>